I did read a lot of comic books growing up, but I know a lot of my favorite uh, comic book superheroes certainly had their powers um, caused by usually some type of radioactive accident. And there's been several, several theories of how that works that are portrayed in the comics, but it all based on some kind of exposure to cells that cells mutate. The way they portray the actual effects is usually just kind of wild imagination. A radiation can be very deadly. You're not going to swallow nuclear waste and turn into a superhero overnight. Radiation exposure has mixed feelings in the public's perception, but in the fantasy world of comic books, radiation has given birth to some of the mightiest superheroes known in pop culture. Scientists Stephen Curtis and Ted Hartwell will dispel the false depictions behind radiation in popular superheroes and the true scenario of its effects on the human body. In Radiation, Reality. Superheroes are a product of belief and the power of science. Not only are they born of their writers and artists, they are also born of their time period. The rise of superheroes came in the mid 20th century, a time when America and the rest of the world entered the atomic age. With the threat of nuclear warfare on high alert, and the biological effects of radiation drawing public attention. Into the era that they were in, like the 40s, uh, people just heard about the bomb. So a lot of them had to do with radiation coming from a bomb or a, a radiation release event. The science is fascinating. A lot of people don't realize we didn't split the atom, or didn't realize atoms could be split until 1938. And by 1945, we had a bomb that worked. So people got introduced to radioactivity uh, by a bomb which is sort of unfortunate way because there's a lot of benefits that can be had from that, but that's what happened. So radioactivity was sort of a very new concept, even to scientists, but certainly to the public. And so their, their imagination went wild, I guess, after that. In order to decipher its true scientific nature, it must first be clarified. Radiation is generally invisible, weightless, and has no smell or odor. So what exactly is radiation? Radiation is a method by which atoms lose energy from the nucleus. Radiation in general is just a, a type of energy. It deals with lots of different types of energy. For instance, uh, radio waves can be energy, visible light is energy, uh, ionizing radiation, which is what most people are thinking about when they hear the radiation. Things like the type of radiation that's produced by nuclear power plants or in a nuclear weapon, uh, but also in nature. So to be radioactive, that means the, the object or the particle or the rock or whatever is literally putting off ionizing radiation. But literally every living thing on the planet is radioactive and we're all giving each other a little dose of radiation just by standing next to each other. In a very general sense, um, public fear of the word radioactivity and radiation is, is greatly exaggerated. Uh, and certainly one of the biggest myths would be that radioactivity can give you superpowers. In general, if it's going to do anything at all, it's going to have a deleterious effect, you know, that's going to harm you in some way. To think that there'd be a random change in all your cells and all your bodies that would produce these great effects, again, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's just hard to imagine. So let's take a look at some radiated superheroes. Superman. Neither human nor born on Earth, but by the power of the sun, he receives superpowers enabling him with flight, X-ray and heat vision, along with superhuman strength and speed. I don't think it's ever really explained in the Superman story what specifically it is about the radiation that causes those changes. We just know that he was born under a red sun and that the, the yellow sun's radiation gives him his power and then any exposure to his old one kind of transforms him back to a, you know, a weak, a regular mortal or even, even less. So the difference between a red sun and a yellow sun, astronomically that's a red sun is just a late stage large yellow sun, that's what they progressed to, red giants. His powers apparently came from the different wavelengths. If it's red light or yellow light, it just means it's a different wavelength of light. So basically if you get a shorter wavelength, you get a higher energy content in the light. So red is low, yellow is higher, and if you get really high, you get up to gamma rays, next rays, and things like that. So how that affects Superman is 
physically kind of curious. There's not exactly a physical way that you can relate that because yellow light hitting you may cause your skin to uh, do chemical changes and things like that based on the cells in it, but it's not going to ionize the cells to any great degree. Some of the components of sunlight are ultraviolet and higher, so that's why you'll get a sunburn, because now ultraviolet, you get in the range of where it is sort of ionizing and it can change. X-rays are light, okay, there's high energy light, so they penetrate more. Technically, if he has X-ray vision, from the physical understanding, there's some way that you have to get radiation from behind it or somehow out of it to see the contrast. So I get where maybe he has sensitive eyes that can see the X-ray levels, but how do you send the rays out and get them to come back is still kind of, kind of nebulous. Red is the lowest color that we can see, the lowest energy color we can see, and actually heat comes from something called infrared, which is even lower energy than that, which we can't see. We can't see infrared without a tool, without a, a device. Uh, so maybe if he can exude enough infrared energy from some source, he can create heat. I mean, that's where it comes from. So great that he has it, just don't know physically how to explain how it would work. <laughs>
now you can become radioactive. So how does that change the DNA? Randomly, it's, it's, it's up to chance, but ch again, chances of it being a very beneficial change is, is kind of long. So again, not conveying any superpowers, but uh, the potential to have a slightly increased uh, risk of cancer depending on the, the, the element. Is it possible for human DNA to be mixed with the DNA of a spider? So spiders have a way to uh, shoot webs out, okay? So they have specialized cells that make the web material and, and shoot out the web. That means the DNA has to be told what that code is, right? If you can cleave in a part that says build this cell to be a cell that manufactures web material and build this cell to be the cell that is differentiated to shoot it out, if you cleave that into a cell that you already have, there's a chance that cell could, could go ahead and do that. It's not impossible. But to do that, you'd have to actually get the DNA code from the spider, mix it with the DNA code in your human DNA without destroying the whole rest of its, its function. It's not that easy. Possible, but not that easy. A team of four doing a risky test flight in outer space gets hit with an intense exposure of cosmic rays, mutating their bodies and giving them each their own unique superhuman abilities deciding to use their powers for the good, they become the Fantastic Four. What is cosmic radiation? So cosmic radiation is ionizing radiation. Um, when you hear the word cosmic radiation, you're talking about these very high energy uh, gamma uh, uh, sources which can be produced naturally in the sun through its nuclear fusion process or can be uh, produced by uh, supernova which send out just these massive gamma ray bursts and sometimes travel across the entire galaxy or even from other galaxies and, and can make it to the surface of the earth in quantities enough for us to, to measure here even though they've been in transit for millions of years in some cases. And most of it's from the sun because the sun's just the closest producer of that called the solar wind. If you talk to scientists, you might hear the term of solar wind. It's the radiation flowing out from the sun out into the universe. It's, it's a tremendous amount of radiation people don't think about every day because none of it, a, lot, a good chunk of it does not hit the earth. It's deflected by something you may have heard of the Van Allen belt, okay? And how does that mutate the cells of the body to produce superpowers is a physical explanation I, I can't see. I'm, I'm not gonna say you can't manipulate cells to allow you to be elastic and, and stretch and everything. I can't see the physical manifestation of that and I don't see even if there was an explanation how an event with a cosmic ray could just cause just the exact mutations that would make all that work. It's a nice thought process and it makes for fun comics but again physically you can't explain that phenomena in any cogent fashion or anything that we've observed. They are real, they're out there, and when you are in outer space, you are exposed to a great deal more cosmic radiation than you are here on Earth because you don't have the protective layer of the atmosphere between you and those cosmic sources. So um, uh, that's one thing that the comic book gets right. Um, they, they are exposed to higher doses of cosmic rays. Uh, again, the amounts that they would be exposed to on a short trip would generally not have uh, any health effect at all, uh, even, uh, even long term, uh, if it's a short trip into space. But it's a very real consideration that they're looking at for astronauts who, for example, would take a trip to Mars in the future, where you're talking about a multi-year trip, um, and they, they are looking at ways to shield the astronauts from the cosmic rays over the duration of that trip, because it's a, a very important thing. But again, no superpowers conveyed, and in that particular case, probably uh, no negative effects either. As a scientist and engineer, you really don't say anything's impossible. I mean, because what, what we do as scientists particularly is try to find the things that we observe and explain them. Uh, but they do generally follow physical laws that we know about, and we tend to obey those laws because we can predict what might happen with something. So if you mess with the DNA, you're messing with the chemistry set that runs your, your body. To understand how every cell in your body would suddenly get the same type of mutation that would be a beneficial mutation, maybe give you superpowers, maybe make your cells work better. Randomly, that just doesn't work out. No, normally, the mutations are bad, and your body's very good at finding out when there's bad mutations and get rid of them. 
you know, I think where they get it right uh, a lot of the time is um, they portray kind of both this um, good and bad side to radioactivity. So not only do you have the the good superheroes who receive these powers from radioactivity, you've also got the villains that are using radioactivity for um, a very bad uh, and evil purposes. And in a real sense, that, that is the story of radioactivity because uh, radioactivity in our lives has a lot of benefits in terms of the power received from nuclear power, in terms of curing cancer, in terms of radiotherapy and uh, zapping those cancer tumors with large doses of radioactivity. And then on the bad side, obviously, uh, nuclear weapons, depending on which side of the equation you're on, if a nuclear power plant if you have a serious accident and the, the radiation that's produced can certainly be lethal. I think that's where comic books uh, get it right, showing both the good and, and, and bad sides. To further the discussion, Stephen Curtis and Ted Hartwell have given public lectures on radiation in comic books, as well as general discussions that educate the public on the pros and cons of radiation. I'm a health physicist. I'm part of a member of the American Nuclear Society. Uh, part of our charter is to go educate the public. So any chance I get to go talk about radiation, try to explain it to and answer questions, I'm, I'm all over because I think the public should understand more about it. So if you can get people to come and listen to a comic book presentation and still get to explain radiation to them, then I'm, I'm happy to do that. I think it's, it's an important thing to do. I was actually uh, asked if I would do that research. Um, I, I manage a network of radiation monitoring stations around the Nevada National Security Site, but also has a great uh, public outreach component to educate people about what we know about radioactivity, what's the myths, uh, what's the reality. And while I had never specifically researched that at that point in time, I thought it was pretty cool just because of the, the background I'd had in, in both areas of interest, even though I'd never combined them. It's still people worried about it, so part of that is if I can educate people more about it, that they can make an informed decision instead of just listen to the hype that they hear. I think people can make a better decision about things they want to do when it deals with radiation. So reactors and things like that, generally they're more afraid of them than they ought to be. And if I can explain to them why, maybe they won't be so worried about them and maybe we can garner some more benefit from, from positive radiation experiences.